Okay, let's recap where we are in terms of the material. We started out, if you remember, with the attack on financial markets. And then, uh, last class, we talked about the productive role of financial markets. And if we're in a point where we're trying to explain, well, if they're so important, if they're so vital to our economy, why is it that they're under attack? What are the causes for this attack? And last time we discussed the, the perception of the common man. Why the common man, the, the person who doesn't know a lot of economics, who's not an intellectual, why is he antagonistic towards financiers, towards financial markets? And today we're going to talk about the intellectual's role. Because as we saw last time, the common man's ignorance is driven by guidance he is getting from the intellectuals. They are telling him what to look at and how to interpret the observations. So what is it that motivates the intellectuals? Or what are the philosophical roots of the attack? And I'm going to look at two. Now you could take any bad philosophy, I think and work it out to the point to economics and, and, and come up with the same uh, negative view of financial markets. I've chosen two that I think are very influential in the culture today. The first is Christianity. Now, you might recall the view of Christianity of wealth. Remember, the, uh, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Jesus threw out the money changes from the temple. So Christianity from early on has a negative view of wealth, of success, of money, of making money as a goal. And probably the earliest mention, or one of the earliest mentions, because this, this actually goes back to the Greeks, one of the earliest mentions of an anti-finance attitude is the Christian's attitude to usury. If you go back to the early Christian writings, all the way through Thomas Aquinas, usury is considered a sin. It is considered evil to be a usurer. A usurer is a person who charges interest on money that he's lent. Any interest. Any amount. The idea of making money from money is sinful. And usurers in the early days of the church were persecuted and excommunicated. Now, the Christians still needed to take out loans. They still needed financing for whatever little business activity was going on in the Middle Ages. So who did they turn to? Who did they turn to who could? The Jews. Because the Jews, according to at least to my understanding of the Jewish religion, the Jews are prohibited from charging interest from other Jews. But they're not prohibited from charging interest from non-Jews, from infidels. Okay? So the Jews could lend money freely to Christians. And they did. Here was an entrepreneurial opportunity to make money. So, yeah. You might point out that the Jews were prevented from going into the other businesses. That's yes, and, and that's why in general they became merchants rather than landowners and, and, and went into agriculture because they were prevented from, uh, from those industries by law. But I would say that one of, the, one of the original sources in Europe for anti-Semitism is this Christian idea that they were dependent financially on the Jews and the Jews were committing a sin by lending the Christians money. Now the real sin under Christianity is to lend the money, not to borrow it. Paying interest is okay. It's just charging the interest that is evil. Now think of what that means. If I... If I take um, the different kind of financial assets, the different kinds of financial instruments, I would divide them into three. 
One is money. And different types of money substitutes, like checking and credit cards and so on. The second is equity. Equity is like stocks. It, is, it gives you an ownership stake in your investment. Okay, partnerships, preferred stocks, and stocks are types of equity. And finally, debt. Now, debt is the most prevalent financial asset. All bonds are debt. Saving accounts in a bank are debt. You are lending the bank money. Accounts payable that a company has is debt. All kind of commercial notes, commercial papers. All, most of the financial transactions in our economy involve debt instruments. Now, what are the Christians saying? Christians are saying this is evil. Can't do that. And the Jews are evil for doing it. If you look at world literature, uh, you find the Jew as moneylender being portrayed as evil. These are the first instances of financiers being portrayed as evil. Uh, just some of the, the, the more popular ones, Shakespeare, uh, the Merchant of Venice, Shylock, the Jewish moneylender is portrayed as a money-grubbing, sleazy um, moneylender. Then Dostoevsky, I'd like to read you a, a short quote after Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. It was well known, too, that the young person had, especially of late, been given to what is called speculation, and that she had shown marked abilities in the direction, so that people began to say that she was no better than a Jew. It was not that she lent money on interest, but it was known, for instance, that she had for some time past, in partnership with old Karamazov, actually invested in the purchase of bad debts for a trifle, a tenth of their nominal value, and afterwards had made out of them ten times their value. What was she investing in? Junk bonds. These are junk bonds. No different from the junk bonds in the 80s. So already, in the days of Dostoevsky, over, uh, you know, about a hundred years ago, junk bonds were considered something really bad and really evil that speculators and Jews dealt in. So a lot of the animosity, a lot of the animosity, especially among um, the common man and within the conservative movement, in the right, on the right, and as we'll see, a lot of the persecution of financiers in the 1980s originated with Republican conservatives, okay? not with the left. So a lot of the antagonism on the right, on the Christian right, and among common people towards financiers, I think has its origin in Christianity's view of wealth, of finance, of usury. Okay? Usury being one of the cornerstones of finance. You can't charge interest and debt, financial markets do not exist. The second set of ideas, the second philosophy, is Marxism, which among intellectuals in our cult culture is a dominant philosophy. Not in its pure form, but definitely in its subtleties. According to Marx, productive activity and manual labor are one and the same. So the only productive activity in an economy is making things with your hands. Which of course excludes finance completely. Finance is not productive. It is just dividing up the pie, dividing up the cake, as we saw in the quotes in a previous class. This is the doctrine that underlies much of the condemnation of financiers, much of the condemnation of businessmen in general. They're not productive, they don't add anything. All they do is divvy up the pieces. The focus for the Marxist is on manufacturing jobs, on making things on the perceptual level. According to Marx, any profits that the financiers might make, just like any profits that the businessmen might make, are, what's the word he uses? Exploitation. It's not earned, they've exploited it, they've basically stolen it from the workers. This is money that really belongs to workers and the financiers have stolen it or the businessmen have stolen it. 
In a pure Marxist world, there's no role for finance here. They don't need it. Now, modern intellectuals are not that extreme in their views, in their Marxism. They realize that you need financial markets. But they view financial markets as parasites. You know, just like in biology, you have those little fish that pick the food out of the whale's teeth. You know? They're despicable, they're sleazy, you really don't want to think about it, but they kind of need it. Okay? They're necessary evils. And that's how finance is perceived. It's a necessary evil. Yeah, you need to somehow convert those savings into capital. But we wish we didn't have to deal with it. We wish we really didn't have to do it. Capital markets should be, according to this theory, just transferring people's saving to labor. Because again, businessmen don't really have a role under this theory. So the real producers are labor and financiers are just the conduits, the neutral conduits of this capital. And then you can see if that's all they do. They're just parasites moving the money around and it's, it's a, it seems like a very simple thing to do, then of course you can't explain how somebody like Michael Milken could make $500 million in one year. That's his, that was his salary, I think, in 1986. And nobody can make $500 million in just transferring, you know, cleaning the whale's teeth. There's no way parasites should make those kind of profits. Now, to quote one of my favorite leftist intellectuals, uh, Robert Reich, our, our uh, Secretary of Labor. Robert Reich talks, and I quote, about a brain drain from product to paper. So there's a brain drain. The smart people are going from uh, making things from the product to shuffling papers, financiers. All they're doing is moving things around. Quote again from Reich, our best minds are increasingly drawn to the pie dividing professions of law and finance and away from the pie enlarging professions like engineering and science. So all financiers do is they take the cake, you remember the cake from the first class? They take the cake and they slice it up and they divvy it up and some people they give small slices and other people they give large slices and of course they are collecting the crumbs. So they don't do anything to enlarge the pie, they just divide it. And this is straight out of Marx. There's no productive role for financiers. It's all in the labor. The laborer made the pie, and all the financiers doing is dividing it up. Again, a complete parasite uh, with, with the role equivalent to a parasite in nature. Nothing beyond that. Now, underlying both the Christian view and the Marxist view is, of course, in ethics, altruism. Remember that the profit motive, the idea of making money, is essentially an expression of egoism. It's an expression of selfishness. You don't make money for other people. You're making money for you. Companies seek profits for themselves, for their shareholders, not for society. So an altruist views the making of money as something selfish, something bad. Now this, I think, is m true uh, to a large extent with financiers. Financiers, and take for example speculators in the stock market are clearly seeking profit for themselves. There's no other motive for them to trade. It's very hard for a financier to hide behind a product, like many CEOs do, unfortunately. They say things like, yeah, we're making profits, but we're investing all the money in R&D so we can have products which will benefit society. That is their explanation. If you listen to uh, drug company CEOs, you know, when, they, when they're about to be regulated, this is the justification for making profits that they use. Now, that is close enough to the perceptual level that people can deal with. Now, financier to make that argument would have to explain the role of financial markets and why it is that if they do their job well, then companies can then make products that benefit society. And that's too complicated. So they, it, it's too far removed on the perceptual level. 
for them to even attempt to hide behind the product to make an altruistic argument. So what does somebody like Michael Milken, how does he defend himself in court? He says, well, with all the money that I made, I gave a lot to charity. And he did. So he uses an altruistic defense, but he can't connect it to the product. He can't connect it to his profession. And that's why I think altruists go after financiers more than they do after businessmen. For example, if they went after uh, Bill Gates, the way they, and they do go after Bill Gates, but not to the extent they went after Michael Milken. If they went after Bill Gates to that extent, then most people would say, well, you know, how bad can Bill Gates really be? I'm, I'm using his products. They're pretty good. I would pay 50 bucks for this. So if he may, if he is making money on this, there's some justification because, yeah, I'm getting some, some value from it. But what value did I ever get from Michael Milken? I got nothing from it. Again, it's too far removed from that perceptual level uh, that people can identify with. Now, again, just to, just to, to make real this, this altruistic um, uh, view, I'm going to quote again from Robert Reich. He just has some of the best quotes on this topic. And I quote, Profitable companies may, co may contribute to a good society, but ultimately the end is not profits. Let's not simply say profits are good without understanding that there are social consequences here that have to be traded off. Profits are very important, but they're not the only important thing. He continues, by some measures, AT&T did precisely what it ought to have done. But the fundamental question is whether society is better off. This is complete altruism. Somehow, and of course, who's going to tell whether society is better off? Robert Reich. I mean, who else would? Now, it consider how he phrases these, these sentences. It is amazing to me because he starts, he always says something positive and then something negative about exactly the same thing. So he says, by some measures, AT&T did, some, AT did something good, but we should consider the bad things. Uh, or he says, let's not just say profits are good because there are also these consequences. And, he, and, he, and he, he does this continuously implying, and he actually says this explicitly sometimes, implying that he's actually for free markets. But we have to consider other things as well. So he's, he's uh, epistemologically, he's, trying to, he's, he's confusing people. He says nothing that you can pin him down to um, in any of these quotes. Just a final horrifying one, again from Robert Reich. The, the ones I've given you up till now were from, from this year, from a Harper magazine um, uh, interview. This one's from 1989. The bankers and lawyers who helped RJR Nabisco move out of equity and into debt late last year earned about one billion dollars for their efforts. This sum exceeds the total amount devoted by the United States in all of 1988 to the search for a cure for AIDS. Now those two are connected, right? There's a relationship there. Now, what's he trying to do? Why is he doing that? He's trying to imply that that million dollars that went to the financiers could have gone to help AIDS patients. These financiers are taking money away from research to help AIDS patients. These evil financiers are responsible for these people dying ultimately. So you can see how altruism is everywhere in their argument. The standard is always uh, somehow maximizing social benefit. Of course, they can never define what that means. And it ultimately comes down to what the powers to be think it, have, it should be. Now, what is their goal? What is the intellectual goal, intellectual's goal in attacking the financial markets? I think today they are out to destroy whatever remnants of a market economy we have. Putting themselves in a position to control the economy. People like Robert, Robert Reich are power lusters. They want control. So they want to destroy the market economy. They want to destroy those people who profit from it. They ultimately want to destroy achievement. 
Now, how, did, how are they trying to do this? Well, first, by perpetuating ignorance. We saw last time what kind of nonsense they are teaching uh, people who watch the news, people who go to school, people who are interested in finding out what is actually going on here. Part of it's just in the terminology they use. As soon as you put junk together with bonds, you create the perception that there's something wrong here. There's something awful, a hostile takeover. Second way they do this is by demonizing, discrediting the successful financiers and other businessmen, denying that they're productive, denying that they provide any kind of benefit. By doing that, they, they create the illusion among people that they're socially useless. These people, they do something that's completely useless. Now, once people are convinced that a certain profession or a certain group of people are useless, it is a very short way, a very short step, to go from that to criminalizing the activity that they are performing. So if you look at the 1980s, the first step was, was to uh, talk about how unproductive financial markets were. Not only were they not productive, they were destructive. They were causing the United States to be less productive and less competitive with Japan and Germany and the other countries in the world. That's one step after that was to go after these financiers. Once you established an atmosphere of these people don't do anything, well, if they don't do anything productive, how can they make so much money? They must be doing something illegal, they must be doing something bad. And that's how they got most of the financiers in the 1980s. Now, why are they going after finance in particular? And again, I think they go after finance more than they do after other types of businesses. First, because it's intangible. It is far removed from the perceptual level. It is difficult to understand. The productive role of financial markets is not self-evident. Secondly, it is very visible. People hear about these big deals. They hear about the amount of money the financiers are making. They see the stock market going way up or way down. They also take advantage of the historical animosity that Christianity is rooted in our culture towards financiers. And in the general sense of mystery that many people have with regard to money and where money comes from and how do you really make money from money? What is this whole notion of interest? Where does it come from? Some people talk about money as a, almost as a mystical experience. It's, it's something they don't understand, they can't comprehend and therefore it is something that is easy to pervert. So if you combine a field that is relatively abstract intangible, removed from the perceptual level, with a high visibility, and some of, the, some of the people making lots of money, historical animosity, you've got a mixture here that makes finance easy to attack, very attractive for the intellectuals. And of course, as we've seen, it is at the heart of our economic system. If you destroy it, you destroy the economic system. Free markets, whatever bits of capitalism we have left, would stop functioning without financial markets. Any questions? Yeah. Do you think that the, uh, the intellectuals who are out to destroy the financiers actually understand that financial markets and institutions are at the heart of the free market economy? I think many of them do, and if they don't, they're just evading on a massive scale. And, using the other and, and then they're using the other reasons. So I, I think like somebody like Reich it has to be evading on, on, a, on a massive uh, level. He, he's not an idiot. Uh, he is well-educated. 
you just have to open your eyes and look. If, you, if you're above the perceptual level, you don't need that much information. If you live in that world, if you, if you study economics and you investigate, put a little bit of research into seeing what Wall Street does to figure out what's going on here. So it is not innocent. It's either they know it and they're fighting, they're fighting it anyway because of Marxist ideals or, or for whatever other reason, or they are evading it. They are blocking it out. <coughs> so I don't think any of this is innocent. Do you, uh, do you think they really believe that it's a zero-sum game, or is that just a facade they set up to make the argument easier to present to the public? Again, I think it depends on who. I think some, some people clearly believe it's a zero-sum game. And as we'll see when we talk about the stock market, again, it takes even a, a, one additional step of abstraction to understand that it's not. At least some of it it's not. But some of it is clearly enlarging. The, just the ability to transfer capital from savings into capital, to transfer money into, from saving into capital, just that process is clearly pie enlarging. How could you form companies without that? How could businesses expand without that? And they have to be evading that. They have to be evading again on a massive level in order to, in order to truly believe that. So, so again, I think it's either evasion or or some other form of corruption where, they, where they, they understand it and they're fighting it anyway. Some of it is more subtle. Some arguments might be a little bit more subtle and more complex and, and they really don't understand. But again, people like Robert Reich are no idiot. He's actually a real altruist. He's a real altruist, yes. <laughs> he is. And, and he's, um, he's very explicit about it. But he's very clever in how he presents himself. Because he always makes the point of saying, I'm for capitalism, but. Or I'm, I like at and I don't think they did anything wrong, but. You know, he, so he, he tries to make few people feel comfortable that he's a very tolerant guy. He's not an extremist. He doesn't really want to go after them. Um, and, and it's amazing. And it, it, you probably noticed this. Those of you who have seen him on, uh, on TV with uh, Dr. Peacock on, on the Comedy Channel. Um, and when every time he's put in a corner, the way he diffuses the argument is by making fun of himself. So he'll make a, a short people joke. He does this at every opportunity he can. He'll tell a joke about short people. You know, he's, he's about that tall. And that diffuses it, and he gets people's sympathy, and he plays these cards so cleverly that you get the sense that he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, okay, what are the ramifications? What are the ramifications of these attacks? Well, we get a general disrespect in large segments of the public for finance, for financiers, for the activities involved. They really don't believe this is productive. You know, and I think I told you when I um, tell people I teach a course in uh, finance and ethics, they say, isn't that a contradiction in terms? That's the normal response that I get. Even some of my students who take the class <laughs> come into the class at least thinking that. Some of them leave the class thinking that too. Um, as a consequence of this, finance is ripe for regulation, for heavy regulation. And financiers are ripe for persecution. During the 1980s, successful financiers, were, one could say, were systematically persecuted by people like Rudolf Giuliani. <coughs> case after case, of which Michael Milken is only the most visible, Wall Street professionals were arrested, their lives ruined, the assets seized under the RICO Act, the Racketeering Act, which was passed in order to fight what? Organized crime. So the RICO Act is being used to fight organized crime and Wall Street. Many of these cases were later thrown out of court because there was absolutely no evidence to convict these guys. Yet this took five, six years of appeals, and by that time their professional careers 
were ruined. Many of their assets were seized by, seized by the government, so they got no return on those assets for many years. So lives were ruined. And a, a, a book I, I highly recommend that, that um, uh, gives you a detailed description of this as payback, which is available just across the college. Payback by Dan, uh, Daniel, I think it's Feischel, or Fischel, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's an excellent analysis of the, the witch hunt, you could call it, of these financiers during the 1980s and the political motives of the people uh, prosecuting them. Ultimately, all this leads to less growth, a decrease in the productivity of labor, and a decrease in the standard of living for everybody. Financial markets become less efficient, some of the best financiers are taken out and put in prison. They are heavily regulated, and they just don't work as well as they could. And as a consequence, they don't serve their productive role as well as they could, and therefore they don't, as we've seen, they, if, they, if they function correctly, they increase the productivity of labor, they increase the standard of living. Well, they can't do that, so whatever increases we have are much slower than they otherwise would be. So... All these roadblocks have a real effect on all of our standard of living. Okay, we have finished, for now at least, the uh, section on the attack on financial markets. We're going to move on now to a concrete example of the productive role of financial markets, and I'm going to use as the concrete example the stock market. So we're going to talk about the productive role of the stock market. And then, uh, tomorrow, we're going to take one specific function of the stock markets, and we're going to talk about corporate restructurings. But what role the stock market has in restructuring corporations, and whether that is a productive role or not. Okay. Now, are there any questions on what we've completed up to this point? Yeah. Is there any correlation between the uh, attacks on the financiers and the stock market crash of 87? Because you said it happened a lot in the 80s. Um, yes. Um, October, October 19th, 1987, uh, was the day the stock market crashed, but 20, dropped 25% during that day. That, this is not directly the persecution of financiers, but it's related. That same day, um, the, final, the final passages were being written, the final uh, uh, formulations were being made, and new regulations that were supposed to, that the, both the um, House Banking Committee and the Senate Banking Committee were working on to regulate the activities of financiers with regard to takeovers and leverage buyouts. I believe that is no accident. That is a market, part of the rise of the stock market during the 1980s can directly be attributed to takeovers, LBOs, to those kind of financial activities. Both House and Senate in 1987 were considering major legislation that will block that. And the market, I think, responded by declining by 25% or more if you take a few days together, if you take the 17th or the 16th and the 19th together. Um, by declining, and it is interesting that the legislation was wiped off the books. It never went, got out of committee after the market dropped. Uh, it was, in a sense, the market sending a very strong message to the politicians, don't touch this. Now, as we'll see, the legislation got passed elsewhere. The states picked it up, and, and, and now you, we've got massive anti-takeover legislation in the states. But the federal government never touched that. So it's not direct, but it is, it's, it's an indirect effect. Not only that, but if you look at the collapse in the junk bond market in 1989, collapse in the junk bond market is a direct link to the, to, to the uh, destruction of Drexel. Drexel was the company that Milken worked for, which the government destroyed, and the, um, the, persecution, or the persecution of Milken. If Milken and Drexel had been healthy, 
had been allowed to do what they do best, the junk bond market would not have collapsed in 1989. Now, there's some other causes which we'll, we'll get to later in the course, but there's no doubt that these persecutions had dramatic effects on financial markets and financial activity, uh, and they're still having to this day. That is, the kind of activity that we're not seeing in financial markets today is a direct consequence of the fact that Milken went to jail. And people like Milken went to jail, and therefore that kind, the kind of things that Milken was doing, which were good, are not being done today. Because nobody will touch it. Okay. Any other questions? Only if you can answer it without taking too much time. Is it possible to quickly explain high yield bonds, how they work, what they do? I will, either next class or the class after that, when I talk about takeovers, I will talk about junk bonds. The stock market. Okay. To talk about the stock market, it's first, what are stocks? What is a stock? Anybody? An ownership claim, okay. So stock is a claim against the assets of a company. That's a special kind of claim, right? Because it's not like a partnership claim. What makes it different than a partnership? Legally, what is it? What makes it different? Why do we have corporations and partnerships? What is the limited liability? So the distinctive feature about stocks is the fact that they an ownership claim that provides the owner with limited liability. What that means is that if the corporation goes bankrupt and it owes a lot of money, the debtors cannot come to the stockholders demanding payment. You're not liable beyond what you paid for the stock. So you can lose the, the, all the value of the stock. They can't come out of your personal assets. They can't come after your personal assets. For example, in a partnership, if the partnership goes bankrupt and it owes a lot of money, you are responsible for paying those debts back as a partner. So stock is an ownership claim which provides the owners with limited liability. Okay? Now, what's a stock market? Yeah, it's a place in which stocks are bought and sold. And you could have a physical location for a stock market, like the New York Stock Exchange, where if you've seen pictures, people run around selling and buying. Okay. Or you could have it on a computer network without a physical location, like NASDAQ, which deals in smaller companies, where you buy and sell on computers. You, you say, I want to buy IBM at 52, somebody wants to sell, you, the computer matches the trades. So the stock market allows the selling and buying of stocks. Now, what role, what productive role does this serve? Why is it important that we have stocks and that we have a stock market? I think it's very easy and uh, cheap to transfer uh, ownership. Okay. Why is that important? Why do we care if we can transfer ownership? Because the one that gets it is the, is the cheapest and the most efficient uh, person to use it. Let, let's say like I would be more efficient in running this uh, company, mm -hmm. so I would be the better person to run it. So it's very easy to just buy the stocks instead of going through a big deal of uh, contracts and I don't know, whatever. It, it consumes a lot of time and uh, money. It makes the buying and selling of stock a, a relatively easy, efficient, low-cost transaction. Yeah. That makes it easy to get out of non-profitable ventures and into more profitable ones. Okay, so again, it makes it easy to, to execute the trade. Now, but again, look a little bit more fundamental. Why do we care? Yeah. It also offers a great deal of capital that otherwise wouldn't be available. Okay, so it, the primary function here is to allow corporations to raise large amounts of capital in a very efficient way. By selling stock. Now we'll see how the other things you've said fit into that in a few minutes. 
Now, how does this done? How does a corporation sell the stock to a large number of people? What financial institution is involved in that, in setting that up, in that transaction? What? Underwriter. Underwriter. Uh, investment banks. Investment banks do the underwriting of stocks. What does an investment bank do? It buys the stock, let's say Netscape, once it go public, they buy the stock from Netscape, and then they turn around and they sell it to the market. That's what an underwriter does. Netscape has access to a very large amount of capital, and it has many owners now. That capital has come from lots of people. Yeah? Why don't Netscape sell it directly? Why do they need an underwriter? Uh, yeah. Well, they, primarily because the underwriter has a market. But it is possible for a company to sell its own stock. I mean, you can do that, but an underwriter has a customers to buy the stock. Underwriter makes the process more efficient, and they do two things. One, they have access to the market. They have cheap, easy access to the market to, to different investors. They can call them up. They rec recommend the stock. In addition, the underwriter has the expertise to go to Netscape, check their books, check their products, and say, this company is worth $12 a share. So that when, they, when, uh, when you, the investor, wants to buy, want to buy the IPO, the initial public offering of Netscape, the, the, the stock of Netscape, you're not buying it from Netscape directly, and you don't know how they came up with the figure, but you're buying it from an intermediary who specializes in pricing these things right. They actually have a fiduciary duty to price them right. And under common law, you could sue them if they, if they have breached that fiduciary duty, if they would not done their due diligence in inspecting the company and making sure that this was an appropriate price for them. So they serve as an intermediary. So they help Netscape on the one hand, and they help you, the investor, on the other hand, by providing you with a, a reliable source of information about that company through the price that they provide, okay? the price they put on the stock. So, stock markets allow companies to raise large quantities of money through issuing, through issuing stock. Now, let's see what role in the actual market has to play in this, right? Because most transactions in the stock market do not involve raising capital. Most transactions in the stock market involve you selling a stock to me, and the transaction involves the two of us. It doesn't involve Netscape anymore. So why does the fact that we can trade make it easier for Netscape to raise the capital in the first hand? So what, we want to, what I want to do now is go over some of the other roles that the stock market have and then integrate them all into this primary function of the ability to raise capital. So let's look at some of the additional functions and then integrate them all back. Okay. One of the things that was mentioned was that stock market allows for liquidity. Now what do we mean by liquidity? It means that we can sell the stock when we need money. So I can make an investment in IBM and not be worried about getting a return on my investment over the next 50 years. If I need the money earlier, I can sell the stock. I'm almost guaranteed that there will be somebody in the market, if the price is appropriate, that will buy the stock for me. Not only that, but I can do this at a very low cost, very, very easily. Think of what would happen if you had an individualized contract with IBM? That is, you bought an ownership directly from IBM. There was no secondary market. There was no stock market. So you had a contract saying that you own 5% of IBM. Now you want to sell it. So you have to put an ad in the paper announcing that you have the 5% and would somebody like to buy it. And then you'd have to sit down with that person and show him the books of IBM and try and value the contract. And you would haggle. 
you know, you would, you would have to start negotiating what the appropriate price is. This is all incredibly co costly. You'd have to have a lawyer present to make sure that the contract between the two of you was appropriate, that he couldn't sue you afterwards. Very complicated transaction. Versus, I call my broker up and I say, sell my stock in IBM at $25. And as soon as the market price hits $25, you've sold. And if it doesn't, you don't sell. You can adjust your price. It's very easy, very simple, very efficient. It adds to the likelihood that you would want to be an investor in IBM. So if IBM's trying to raise capital by issuing individualized contracts that were not tradable, it would be very difficult for them to raise that capital. The fact that, they ha that the stock market exists, that this liquidity exists, allows IBM initially to raise that capital. What else does it do? It allows the entrepreneurs, people who initially invested the money in, the, in startup companies, to take their profit relatively early in the, uh, in the life of that company. I'll give you an example. Again, let's, let's take Netscape. Remember, the, the, one of the people who founded Netscape um, was an entrepreneur in founding Netscape. He was also one of the managers, and he provided the capital. I think he invested $50 million in Netscape of his own money. Now, if there was no stock market, if he could not sell stock easily on the market, he would say, okay, I've got $50 million today. Uh, I expect profits of Netscape to be X. I will get a percentage of those profits for the next 50 years. And over those 50 years, I will make money. Is it worth my while to invest $50 million right now in this venture? Versus, I put $50 million right now into the venture. If the product is successful, will go public. I will be able to take out all those future profits I will be able to get in five years by selling my stock to the public. So now I get $500 million in an investment of $50 million up front. Okay? So it allows the entrepreneur to cash out. Now what does this do? Two things. One, it encourages entrepreneurs to invest. Because they know that the investment horizon now is not 50 years, not 20 years or 10 years, but if the product is good, if the company is profitable, the investment horizon is much shorter. Secondly, it provides additional capital. Because what's this entrepreneur going to do with the $500 million that he got now from the, from the sale of the stock? He's going to reinvest that $500 million in some other company. So he's going to now introduce new companies. So think, if you think of venture capitalists, let's say they have a pool of $100 million. And they decide, I'm going to put $10 million in, in, in 10 different companies. And I know that usually nine of them fail and one succeeds. So I need that one to succeed a lot for me to do this. Now I know that I will receive this return, which has to be very, very large in order for me to make this investment, over 20 years. The likelihood of making that investment is relatively small. Versus in three years, I'll be able to take out $100 million, or oh, $200 million, he has to make a profit here, right? He started with 100. So he takes out $200 million on this investment. Now there's $200 million available in this venture capital fund to be divided up into new entrepreneurial ventures. So now I can put $20 million into 10 different ventures or $10 million into 20 different ventures. So the fact that they can go public makes it more likely for these entrepreneurs to invest or these, uh, these uh, venture capitalists to invest. Going public, selling shares, to the of, um, selling shares to the public, also allows for the conversion of fixed assets, like plants and equipment, into cash. If you want it to the reverse of a mortgage, 
Remember we talked about a mortgage, how that, how if you wanted to buy a house and there were no mortgages, you'd have to save for 30 years and then you'd buy the house. And with a mortgage, now you can buy the house now and pay it off over 30 years. This is a way that you have a house and you want to take money out of the house. And you can do that today with, uh, you, you can get home equity loans. Well, this is the equivalent. What you do is, you've got big plant, lots of equipment. And you have ideas for other, other ventures. You want to go on. Or you want to expand. Well, one source of capital is tied up in these fixed assets. A way to make that liquid is to sell stock in those assets. Now you have more capital to make further investments. Okay. An additional role that stock markets will play. The fact that stocks are denominated in small units, they give you very small pieces of corporate ownership, allows lots of investors to buy stock. It in what? Yes, but that wasn't the point I was getting to, but, but you're right. I'll get to that in a little while. By allowing lots of investors to get into it, it allows for an increase in the pool of money available. So if, if you had to privately buy a stake of ownership from IBM, they probably wouldn't talk to you unless you had $10 million, $100 million to do it with. Now if you have 100 bucks, you can buy a piece of IBM. So almost everybody in the economy becomes a potential provider of capital. Everybody in the economy becomes a potential capitalist. Which increases the amount of capital available for production. Makes possible the formation of very large corporations. It's no accident that the largest businesses in the world are publicly owned corporations, or corporations that have sold stock. It is hard to raise the billions and billions of dollars that would be needed in order to, to fund these corporations by issuing bonds or by getting money for private investors. It is much easier, much more efficient, and much more likely to be able to raise that kind of money from the millions of investors out there. IBM has millions of share stockholders. So each one has to just put $100 in, and it's already a huge amount of money. Now, this also allows for something that we call this in finance the separation of ownership and control. It allows stockholders to own the company, but they don't have to manage it. They can hire professional managers to do that job for them. So small investors can now benefit from owning large businesses without having to worry about managing those large businesses, something that they don't have the talent to do or are not interested in doing. They can delegate that responsibility to professional managers whose expertise is doing that specific job. So if you want, it enhances the division of labor. So it provides another means, or provides a means for small investors to benefit from the productive capacity, from the profits of large businesses in the economy. And as a result, it, it is, again, a, another means by which we're converting savings of lots and lots of people into capital to be used by the producers. One more rule. Stock market allows us to value corporations. 
by buying and selling these stocks, a price is set for them. A price which is the estimate, which is the, the best estimate of the best minds that are monitoring this company. So we have financial analysts and we have investment bankers looking at this company, speaking to the managers, looking at the products, looking at the competition and saying this company is worth about 45 and trading based on that information. And by trading based on that information, they move the stock price to what in the context of their knowledge is the value of that company. It is often the best, or it is the best, value that we have for a company. These are professionals that are motivated by what? What motivates them to get it right? Profits. They are motivated by the profit motive. They are looking for stocks that they think are underpriced, and by buying those and making money, moving that price up, and looking for stocks that might be overpriced, and by selling them, moving them down to, to the right price. Now, this is very useful information. It is useful to managers, useful for, to the managers of the company. It is telling the managers, financial markets, the people who are trading in these markets, believe that I am doing a good job. The price of the stock is going up. Well, they think I'm doing a bad job. Now, maybe I'm overlooking something. Maybe they are seeing something that I am not seeing. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. We've used the horse buggy industry as an example. Stocks of the horse buggy company are declining fast. You as the manager, you know, you're making a good product. Sales are, are picking up. They're fine. There's no problems. What am I missing? And it forces you to look around and, aha, there's a new industry being formed which is in direct competition with me, automobiles. So it forces the manager, if the stock is declining, to look to see what is going on. Why is this happening? It is a potential source of important information. Or if the price is going up, it tells the manager the market thinks I'm doing a good job. The market thinks I have good growth opportunities. I should continue in this path. I should continue making the kinds of investments that I am making. Now, this doesn't make the manager in any way second-handed, a second-hander. This is an additional source of information from specialists into the market that he is in into the activities that he is involved in. So they provide information to managers. They also, the price and the movement and change in the price also provides information to other capitalists in allocating their capital, in deciding which companies to invest in and which not to invest in. So falling price in the buggy whip industry tells you, well, you know, maybe that's not the industry to be building a new plant in or to be heavily investing in. This is, this is a sign that this is probably an industry in decline and maybe I should look to invest in something that's going to be profitable in the future. So falling price is telling the markets, is telling other capitalists, is telling managers that the prospects are not good for the future for whatever reason. What does that do? Let's say uh, you're, in a you're in a company where the price of the stock is falling and you want to expand. It makes it very expensive for you to go out and raise capital. Because if the price is low in order to get a given amount of capital, you have to issue lots and lots of shares. The lower the price, the more shares you have to distribute in order to raise a given amount of capital which makes capital very expensive for you. It makes you think, well, you know, I can't really do this, or maybe I shouldn't expand. And that's good, because 
companies with declining stock prices are probably either poorly managed or in declining industries, and we don't want them to make investments. We want capital to be moving away from them into more profit profitable ventures. So bad companies make few investments because the cost of their capital has increased. Firms that are doing well, their stock price is rising, the number of shares they have to issue for a given quantity of capital is smaller, the cost of capital is lower, high stock price, lower cost of capital, which means they're more inclined or it's easier and cheaper for them to raise capital, which is good. These are good firms. We want them to be making capital investments. So the movement of stock prices is also going to determine the investment policy of the firm itself in a way, in a positive way, in a way that adds to productivity. Now, movement of stock price also provides information to other participants in the economy. For example, let's say you are a uh, supplier. I think we, we, I gave this example of it. You're a supplier of uh, goods to the host buggy firm. And now you observe their stock price declining. And now you have to negotiate a new agreement with them. Are you going to give them 90 days credit or just 30 days credit? Or are you going to be a lot more careful in your dealing with them? You're going to say, well, you know, the market thinks this company is a little shaky. Maybe they'll go bankrupt. I don't want to get stuck with a lot of debt. Again, what does that do? It raises the cost of capital for that company, not just in the stock market, but in other markets as well, in credit markets. Or if you're the bond market, if the company is coming to you and wants to issue bonds and raise money that way, you say, well, the stock price has really declined. I'm going to demand a higher interest rate because you are a more risky company. There's a higher probability that you will go bankrupt now. At least that is the information I'm gleaning from the stock market. So it raises the cost of capital for these firms, not only in the stock market, but everywhere. Now, there's something else that a, low, that a declining stock market does. Because you could say, well, why should a manager care? Let's say I'm a manager of a company, the company's doing fairly well, cash flows are coming in, and I don't expect to make any large investment. I don't need to raise capital for another five years. So I don't care what my stock price does. I'll just continue doing what I'm doing. What's going to happen if the stock market is declining in a, in a free market? Somebody will say the assets of this company are not being utilized. This, these managers are not doing a good job. The lower the price of the stock, the easier it is to take the company over. So if you don't pay attention to the information being provided to you by investors in the stock market, if you are not alert to, the, to what's going on in your environment, if you become a bad, lazy manager, then the lower stock price provides an incentive to other managers to come in and kick you out and try and do a better job. So let's say you're managing assets that if utilized efficiently and correctly would result in a stock price of $20. But the stock price right now is $10 because you're a lousy manager and you haven't been noticing what's going on around you. Somebody's going to buy the stock at $10, going to accumulate a large, a large position, kick you out, put in good managers who do the job appropriately, stock price will rise to $20 and they have made a nice return on the investment. If the stock price was just random, then you couldn't do that because it wouldn't reflect the fact that you were doing a good job. So again, the profit motive ha keeps managers on their toes. If they don't do a good job, con uh, the consequence of that is a declining stock price, which makes it cheap to take them over, which means they lose their jobs. So it provides incentives. Lower stock prices provide incentives so Changes in corporate control, replacing poor managers with good managers. <coughs> and we'll, as we'll see, this is a lot of what was going on in the 1980s. And we'll see why. Why is it that there were so many bad managers uh, in the 1980s in US corporations? OK, now uh, 
to Liebe's point about reducing risk. A stock market allows us not only to own a, 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 a stock of IBM relatively easily, but it allows us to own a little bit, if we want, a little bit of lots and lots of companies. We call that diversification. So we can buy some high tech and some banking stocks and some um, uh, agricultural companies and some uh, home building companies and diversify ourselves across almost the entire economy. Now, what does diversification do for us? Why, why is diversification our value? It reduces risk. Now, how does it do that? Well, let's say the high-tech industry is doing poorly one year. Well, in, a, in a normal economy, some other industry is probably doing okay. So our losses from the high-tech are canceled out by our gains from a different industry. Think about it this way. If you could own a little bit of every asset in the economy, if you could completely diversify, what would the return on your investment be? The ex growth of the economy, exactly. It would be exactly equal to whatever the economy was going, because you owned a little bit of everything. The more you diversify, the more closely you match with the growth of the economy and the less risk you're taking on. The risk you're taking on is whether the economy will grow or not. But you're not taking any risk associated with any individual company. So, for example, somebody who's very risk averse, who's afraid of risk, doesn't like taking on risk, can still own stock in Netscape, which is a high-tech, very, very risky company. Why? Because they could own 5,000 other stocks as well. Therefore, they are completely diversified. Their fate is not going to be determined primarily by Netscape, but by the performance of the economy in general. Yet, they have now provided capital to Netscape. These are people who otherwise would never give money to Netscape, they would never provide that capital to Netscape. So suddenly, you've increased the amount of capital available for high-risk ventures by allowing for diversification. Very risk-averse people own, I mean, lots of people own mutual funds. Mutual funds own very high-risk stocks, yet because of the, the diversification, the mutual fund itself is not risky. We are almost out of time. Now, so you can see that all these functions integrate into the primary function of raising the capital. If there was no liquidity, people wouldn't want to own the stock. The company would have a hard time raising the capital. If prices in the market did not reflect the value of the company, again, you wouldn't want to own a stock if the, if the prices in the, in, the, in the stock market were random, right? were just arbitrary. You wouldn't want to own the stock because you wouldn't know when to buy and when to sell and what it meant. And when you bought it, what does this reflect? I'm not, you're not buying anything real. You're just buying a random series and nobody would buy. What makes it attractive is that if, if this company does well, you will make money. That that doing well will be reflected immediately in the price of the stock. So the fact that it provides information, the fact that it provides liquidity, the fact that it provides diversification all make possible the primary function, which is the raising of capital from many, many individuals, thus increasing the pool of capital available for business. It is only because of the existence of the secondary market, the stock market where you trade in securities with one another, that companies can ultimately raise money directly from investors. Okay, so let's stop there and we'll finish our discussion of uh, stock market next time and go on to corporate restructuring. <coughs> I will see you tomorrow.